Blower doors are large fans that we use to pressurize a building to a set pressure, usually 50 pascals. And we then infer how many times all of the air in the building would be replaced if we were to hold that pressure constant for an hour. This is referred to as the air change per hour or ACH at 50 pascals or whatever the pressure we chose was. 50 pascals, by the way, is about the pressure created by a 20 mile per hour wind. A lot of times we use blower door test numbers as a proxy for how energy efficient a house is or building is. And we can really start to obsess over getting low numbers. But are blower doors really a fair indication of efficiency in service? And I'll declare right at the beginning that, yeah, blower door test results tend to be a pretty good indicator of air tightness, which is directly tied to energy efficiency. But it's also true that we sometimes substitute the test itself for what the test is supposed to be telling us. And in obsessing over blower door test numbers, we really can miss the forest for the trees. Before exploring some of the nuance here, I'd like to warn you that this is an exceptionally geeky discussion, and you truly do not need to know any of what I'm about to share to design good buildings. But sometimes it's fun just to geek out. So we're gonna do that. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. How does exterior air get into our buildings? To understand that, we're gonna have to understand what causes air to move from one place to another in general. For airflow to occur between two points, say the outside and the inside, there must be a pathway or an opening connecting those two points and an air pressure difference. Both of these conditions must exist. If we have a pathway or a connection, but no pressure difference, we won't have airflow. If we have a pressure difference, but no pathway, we won't have airflow either. Now, practically speaking, it's very difficult in building design to eliminate or perfectly seal all of the pathways. Pressure differences are generated by wind, temperature, and mechanical equipment. With respect to wind, we'll see positive pressures on the windward side of a building and negative pressures on the leeward side. Wind pressures will cause infiltration through defects in the air control layer on the windward side and exfiltration through defects on the leeward side. Temperature will also induce pressure differences in buildings. The action that produces the upward flow of heated air in a chimney can also produce pressure differences and in air infiltration and exfiltration in buildings. This is a really complex topic, but the concept of warm air rising is a pretty helpful simplification of what's going on. What's interesting here is that line drawn roughly in the middle of the building that's called the neutral pressure plane. Below this line, the building is under a negative pressure, and above this line, the building is under a positive pressure. But the area below the line isn't operating at a uniform negative pressure, and above the line, it's not a uniform positive pressure either. What we have is a pressure gradient. The very bottom of the building is under a comparatively large negative pressure, and as we go up, the pressure is more moderately negative, then only slightly negative, and then right at the neutral pressure plane, the pressure is neutral. Then if we keep moving up, our building is operating at a slightly positive pressure, then a moderately positive pressure, and so on. But at the neutral pressure plane, neither infiltration nor exfiltration will occur even if we have a hole in the enclosure. This is because we need both a pathway and a pressure. Now, the neutral pressure plane is not always in the same spot and we can do things to move it up or down. The volume of air infiltrating the building below the neutral pressure plane will always be equal to the volume of air exfiltrating the building above the neutral pressure plane. So, if we improve our air sealing at the attic and reduce how much air exfiltrates the building at the top, we'd lower our neutral pressure plane and reduce how much infiltration we get at the bottom. If we were to open a second story window, we do the opposite. By increasing the volume of air exfiltrating the building at the top, we'd raise the neutral pressure plane and induce more infiltration below. 
So kind of weirdly, if we have a problem with soil gases, it can be extraordinarily helpful to air seal the attic, not the basement. Anyway, what's important here are the area of the holes in the enclosure and their distance from the neutral pressure plane. Basically, not all holes in the enclosure are created equal. It matters how big they are and it matters where they are. The third way to create pressure differences in buildings is to mechanically induce them. The most popular mechanically induced pressures are from bathroom fans, range hoods, and dryer exhausts. We actually create these pressures on purpose and we do it for two reasons. One is to remove specific pollutants from the space and the other is to encourage air change with the exterior. This is called exhaust only ventilation. It works by using some kind of fan to exhaust air from a space, which causes the space to become negatively pressurized, which in turn causes infiltration through defects in the air control layer to compensate for the air being exhausted by the fan. Air out equals air in. So if we use a fan to exhaust X amount of air from a space, we know that the same amount of air will infiltrate the interior somewhere else through defects in the enclosure. So we need both pathways through our enclosure and pressure differences to have any air exchange. The blower door is not telling us anything about in-service pressure conditions, but it is giving us an idea of the number and extent of the pathways through our building enclosures. Basically, all this is to say that buildings aren't operating continuously at the pressure we pick when we're running a blower door test. The 50 Pascal standard test pressure is helpful so that we can compare different buildings, but what we're comparing is the potential for air leakage through the enclosure, not actual air leakage. Look what happens to our neutral pressure plane when we use a blower door. We raise it way above the ceiling plane so that all of the holes through the enclosure are below it, which means they're all subject to infiltration. The only place we get exfiltration is through the blower door itself. And this has the effect of treating all holes through the enclosure more or less equally, even though they're not equal. Two holes of the same size in different parts of your house can contribute very differently to the actual in-service performance of your house depending on their location relative to the neutral pressure plane. In short, it's really important to remember that the blower door test is not telling you what the air change rate for your house will be. It's telling you what the air change rate is at a particular pressure. A blower door tells you something about the area of holes in your enclosure, but it doesn't tell you how significant those holes will be in service. In cold climates, the temperature difference between the inside and the outside is greater than the temperature difference between the inside and the outside in a warm climate. What this means is that even identical houses with identical discontinuities in the enclosure with identical blower door test numbers will leak air differently depending on the climate they're in. The greater temperature difference in cold climates will induce more air through the holes in an enclosure than would pass through the same holes in the same enclosure if we were to move to a climate where the temperature difference were less. Okay, so let's now use some real numbers to put this all in context. On average, how much air gets from the outside to the inside in a typical house each hour in service? The National Research Council of Canada used tracer gas to determine the average in-service air exchange on homes that had been blower door tested to around eight ACH at 50 pascals. So these were pretty leaky enclosures. And they found that on average, these houses operated at 0.2 to 0.3 natural air changes per hour. So basically all the air in the house was being replaced about every three to four hours. Now, this is on average. Sometimes the air change would be more, sometimes a lot more, and sometimes we'd get very little air change. Okay, but these were cold climate houses. What do you think we might find in warmer climates? Would we expect the natural air change rate to be higher or lower if the climate were warmer? Probably lower, right? Because the temperature effect is a lot less. The Florida Solar Energy Center, FSEC, 
did this kind of research and found that normal wind and stack pressures produced in-service air change rates of about 0.1 in homes that were similarly leaky when tested at 50 pascals. But this was when the mechanical system was not running. So the rate is indeed lower than what we saw in, uh, in the Canadian houses. But what happens when the mechanical system is operating? When the air conditioning is on, the air change rate in these Florida homes jumped to 0.5 to 0.8, which is a huge change. We're talking about a 500% increase or more. And this was caused primarily by duct leakage. But the mechanical system isn't always running, right? It's on only part of the time. So you'd have to average this out to determine the air change rate for a house based on the duty cycle of the air conditioner. If the AC were operating 40 minutes of every hour and the ducts were really leaky, you'd have more air exchange with, uh, with the exterior than you would if the ducts were pretty well sealed and the AC were only on for 15 minutes of every hour. So when the AC isn't on, it can take 10 hours to get one full air change. But if the AC were on full time, we'd get a full air change every one to two hours, which is a pretty big spread. I guess kind of surprising about this is that these numbers seem fairly low, like certainly lower than I would have guessed. I think because we're used to talking about air leakage in the context of blower door tests, it seems odd that these numbers aren't larger than they are. Blower door tests have the effect of really exaggerating the differences between houses. So where does this leave us? We should absolutely strive for airtight homes and low blower door test scores, but in-service performance isn't nearly as sensitive as the test, and there is more to efficient design than airtight enclosures.